consent as a thing between sexual partners has been a huge focus with like maybe a dip into romantic partnership and maybe a dip into like parent-child relationships. When we talk about sharing, when we talk about, oh, well, you've gotten to play with this for a while, now it's time to let somebody else play with it. When we talk about, you can't take your pants off in the grocery store, <laughs> you know? These are, <laughs> these are conversations about consent and like negotiating not just your own consent, but the consent of other people. It's just, we don't often talk about that being consent. Like, do you consent to this? It's more of like a, what is and isn't appropriate. I kind of wish we talked more about it as a consent thing and like actually named it as that because I think that that then opens us up to understanding those things more when it comes to a sexual or romantic context later on. Welcome to the Multi Amory Podcast. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. We believe in looking to the future of relationships, not maintaining the status quo of the past. Whether you're monogamous, polyamorous, swinging, casually dating, or if you just do relationships differently, we see you and we're here for you. On this episode of the Multi Amory Podcast, we are diving into an amazing conversation with Kitty Stryker about consent and difficult consent questions. We did not intend this, but there was so much amazing content in this that we decided to make this into a two part episode so that we could get to as many of the listener questions as possible. We had some really great questions from our audience who submitted for this, as well as some great conversation with Kitty. Kitty Stryker has been working on defining and creating a consent culture for over 13 years through her writing, workshops, and website, consentculture.com. She's the editor of Ask, Building Consent Culture, the author of Ask Yourself, the Consent Culture Workbook, and is especially interested in bringing conversations about consent out of the bedroom and into everyday life. Kitty, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been a while. Yes, nice to be it has <laughs> indeed. <laughs> yeah, we were just talking about it ahead of time. Episode 135 was when we last had Kitty on the show to talk about, and that was around the time that Ask was first coming out yep. back in 2018, mm-hmm. 2017 or so. So it's really My wonderful to have you back here. <laughs> oh, yeah, you never forget exactly. the first baby. <laughs> <laughs> yes, love it. Also, for those of you listening at home, if you're interested in learning more about our fundamental communication tools that we reference on this show all the time, you can check out our book, Multi-Amory Essential Tools for Modern Relationships, which covers some of our most used communication tools for all types of relationships. You can find links to buy it at multiamory.com slash book or wherever fine books are sold. Alternatively, the first nine episodes of our podcast also cover some of those tools, so you can go check those out today. So I want to dive in just because it has been, you know, six or seven years in between the first baby coming out and the workbook baby coming out. Mm -hmm. And I'm fascinated to know from your perspective, how have you watched the public discourse on consent shift or change positively or negatively over the past few years? Oh, boy. Well, I think, unfortunately, one of the things I think I've noticed a lot is the desire for punitive action went from being a very sort of niche conversation into a larger conversation. So a lot of conversations about cancel culture and call out culture, which had been created by black folks, mostly on Twitter, to talk about how to hold each other accountable within the community, kind of got trickled out to everyone else. And we adopted it with not the best intentions, I think. And I, I feel Like, in a way, it's important for us to talk about different strategies for dealing with consent violations. And sometimes that does include things like withdrawing from somebody and and isolating them from the community. But I also understand this sort of pushing back against that that we've seen, including from a lot of consent educators, 
which are like, no, no, that's never appropriate. And I kind of fall somewhere in the middle. I think that sometimes that is the best option, but I also see it used too often, especially against marginalized people. Like it's hmm. mostly effectively used against trans women, black men, disabled people, and I just got to be suspicious of that. <laughs> that that doesn't seem like using it properly to me. So that's that's one thing I've noticed that I have mixed feelings about. I think it's good that we're having conversations about it, but I still think nuance is really not present in so many of those conversations. Kind of regarding that nuance, when we see people getting canceled for something that was said 10 years prior or, or things yeah. like that, that to me feels a little murky and like, wait a minute, should we really be getting upset at this person for the thing that they said back then, the place we were in history in the past, the person that that person was back then, all of those things. I mean, what would you say for things like that that are occurring and the cancellations that are occurring because of stuff said in the past? I think for me, I care a lot about patterns of behavior. And so for me, a tweet here or even even, you know, five tweets 10 years ago, I don't see that as a pattern of behavior. Now, if those tweets are included in current behaviors, then I can see there being a reason to include them, because now you're establishing an ongoing pattern of attitude of potential to cause harm of you know maybe being defensive when people brought this up then i can understand but so often it's not really about that and it's not about people learning it's about punishing them yeah. and i'm not a cop and i don't wish to be a cop so that's not really my department however that said i've also been very frustrated with some people who speak very, very bluntly about cancel culture and how cancel culture is always bad. And so often these people are people who are saying these things because someone close to them has had consequences for their behavior. And so it's like, well, you're a little bit biased, aren't you? I want to shout out Disrupting the Bystander by A.V. Phlox, who's a fantastic writer. That book in particular really goes into how to address situations where one of your friends is being called out and like how to support them while also holding them accountable, which I think is, is a really complicated thing to figure out. I don't think there's a lot of models for that. Hmm. Have you seen any changes in the opposite direction, things that you feel positively about as you've been in this space for the past few years? I mean, I think the fact that I'm seeing more conversations about consent outside of sex is really positive and outside of like physical touch. I think that those conversations are important, but I do think for a very long time, consent as a thing between sexual partners has been a huge focus with like maybe a dip into romantic partnership and maybe a dip into like parent child relationships. But outside of that, it's not really thought about. And I'm glad that we're starting to talk about that more as we talk about the writer's strike, for example. I think talking about unions, talking about collective actions more generally, talking about accountability in, in other areas that aren't just around sexuality is hugely important because that's where we learn all these lessons first. That's where the patterns start to get established. So that's kind of where I'm fixated at the moment. I see. So just to make sure I'm understanding, you're pointing out the fact that when we first learn about consent and not in like the brain sense of learning about consent, like the definition of consent, but literally learning like the social scripts around consent that tends to happen in like these non-sexual, non-physical touch contexts when we're younger. Is that what you're saying? I think they do. I think we don't call it consent. We're starting to. But when we talk about sharing, when we talk about, oh, well, you've gotten to play with this for a while. Now it's time to let somebody else play with it. 
when we talk about you can't take your pants off in the grocery store. <laughs> you know, these are these are conversations about consent and like negotiating not just your own consent, but the consent of other people. It's just we don't often talk about that being consent. Like, do you consent to this? It's more of like a what is and isn't appropriate. I kind of wish we talked more about it as a consent thing and like actually named it as that. Because I think that that then opens us up to understanding those things more when it comes to a sexual or romantic context later on. Yeah, it makes me think of how just the word consent, I think, is part of the obstacle there. Because we tend to think of consent in sort of a legalistic way. And I say mm -hmm. we as in kind of the average person. Because that's when it tends to get presented. It's either... I'm consenting to some terms of an agreement, which is, you know, some sort of a contract type thing. Or we talk about consent in terms of punitive action or, you know, yes. someone did this thing which violated consent and therefore they are a bad person and should be destroyed. Like that's kind of the, the way consent is presented. And I know when we've talked about this in the past on this show, we've tried to get home this idea that consent is this empowering thing that makes our relationships with each other better and that wanting to be good at respecting other people's consent and communicating your own is like this fun cool thing that makes your relationships and your communication better and nicer but yeah. i think that's not the connotation most people have with it right it's this ooh, consent is this okay i've got to figure out exactly what the rules are and it seems like they keep changing every day but as long as i do or don't follow these i know if i'm a good or bad person and I think that's a huge problem. I would argue that's what stems, like that's the stem of so many of the issues that we see. We see people wanting to learn the rules so they can figure out how to follow the rules technically, but not in spirit, you know, or mm -hmm. like trying to figure out the rules so they could figure out, did this person break them? There's not a lot of conversation about bending. Also, they're not really rules, they're guidelines at best and everybody has different ones. I think there is a very real fear of being a bad person and being seen as a bad person and not being able to escape that. Like once you have been deemed a consent violator, that's it, you're ruined. And I try really hard to combat that by saying everybody violates consent all the time. We have a society built on violating each other's consent. You know, I mean, bosses have demanded that I come into work on days that are not my day to work all the time with the risk of me losing my job. That is a violation of my consent and arguably coercion. But there it is. That's part of what being in a job is. And there's a lot of conversations of like, well, if you stay at the job, are you consenting? Is that an overarching consent? Is that then OK for you to have this financial coercion? I don't know. I think it's really complicated. I don't think that there is a simple answer. And I think that probably one of the reasons why my consent work is the more controversial and maybe less popular than some of the other consent writers is because I'm like, I don't have answers for you. And I'm not an expert. I think about this a lot. I'm sort of a philosopher of consent. But a lot of the work that I do is about finding those nuances and saying, OK, how can we have a little bit more grace for ourselves and for each other while also holding each other accountable in a way that is tough love, that encourages us to grow so that we don't stagnate? I think I say in the book something about how exciting to learn how to hurt each other less. Mm -hmm. And like that's yeah. really the attitude that I want to bring to this is like, it's not when I say everyone has violated consent at some point, it's not to be like, you know, we're, we all have original sin, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> it's more to say. So it's OK, like calm down a little bit. Yes, there are situations where it happened not in good faith. And honestly, we've probably all violated someone's consent in some way that wasn't entirely in good faith, too. Like that's a lot of manipulation is that. <laughs> I don't know. I just like I want people to feel like it's OK to be humble. I want to teach people it's OK to be wrong. It's OK to mess up. And you should be trying constantly to do better tomorrow than you did today. 
that's something we can all learn from. And that doesn't mean that any of us need to be locked up. And, you know, I also leave some space that sometimes that is the only thing you can do. And like, mm. I don't like it. I'm a prison abolitionist, but right now we don't have close enough communities to have that protective framework that we would need for that level of transformative or restorative justice. So until we have that, the best thing we can do is learn how to control our own behavior and by doing that, modeling that for everybody else. I love that. That's so <laughs> wonderful. And just a, I, I appreciate, I think on this show, we talk a lot about there isn't just these black and white things out there. So much of it really does lie in the middle. And that that's what you're advocating for is huge and just refreshing because it's so often not what, you know, gets the Instagram likes and stuff. So I really appreciate you saying that. It's a lot scarier because like once you start to say, oh, yeah, like one of the stories that I tend to tell is I remember there was a time at Burning Man, right? That's how the best stories start. <laughs> I had I had taken acid and I had like wandered off. My boyfriend at the time was like napping in the tent. I went to, I don't know, go watch a movie or something at Bad Idea Theater. And I came back and for whatever reason, I just had in my head, I want to jerk this person off like right now. And he woke up and was like, oh, God, um... Am I, am I like violating you because you're on a substance and I'm not? But also like, wait, what's happening? And I just said something like, Shh, cows don't talk, which was not okay. <laughs> as like a response to this very honest concern. And like, I'm grateful he and I were able to talk about it. And that was a big learning moment for me because, yeah, if that, if the genders had been reversed, that would have absolutely societally been seen as unacceptable and it was unacceptable i'm glad that we were able to come at it with a sense of humor and like good faith but at the end of the day that's a sexual violation and like that was something that taught me okay if i'm going to be doing substances i need to be a lot more careful about how i'm interacting with people and I need to have some things in place so that that sort of thing doesn't happen again. So it's one of those stories that's like kind of funny until you really think about it, go, oh, actually, yeah. Ugh. And I want to tell those stories because I want to say, look, I have been researching this stuff for a long time and these things still can happen to me. So it's really important to stay humble. And that that is kind of an area that I wish more sex educators in general were more aware of. I think that in a capitalist society, not to go off on my <laughs> like usual anarchist rant, but in a capitalist society, we reward people for saying that they are experts and those experts can never falter. They can never fail because as soon as you fail even a little bit, then you fall from grace and that's it. That's the end of your career. Obviously, that creates a dynamic where it's not that those people aren't going to fail, but they're very invested in silencing people when they do. I don't want to live in that world. I'd much rather live in a world where we're all like, hey, we all fuck up sometimes. You know, like mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. a safer world to me. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that story, because I think it's such a good example to show how if you write that situation, that story down on paper and like try to feed it into like the consent computer bot or try to feed it into the court of public opinion, it's, you mm -hmm. know, it's going to gum up the works. It's not going to be yep. a clear answer of, well, this was the bad guy and this was the good guy, as it were, or like, this is the way this situation should have been rectified. And yeah, like, you're totally right. Th there is capacity in this, in all of us for these things. It reminds me of, we just recorded an episode on quote unquote toxic behavior and diving mm -hmm. into what are the things that we tend to label as toxic behavior and what are the reasons people might turn towards that toxic behavior? And have we done this toxic behavior? And it falls on that same spectrum that... Yeah, for sure. When you're inside yourself, whether you're a lay person or someone who's earning money as an expert, it gets so murky and it's so hard to see your own behavior. And, it, and especially if there's a financial incentive, not just to silence anyone who might be criticizing you, but also to silence yourself, to like yeah. justify to yourself why you did this behavior because it's easy because you have all the information in your head of like what was in your heart and brain or what substances you were on 
when it yep. happened. So yeah, I really appreciate you sharing those stories and, and being so vulnerable because I think it does help. It does help for people to know, to know these things. I think it's helpful to say like, look, like I am very vulnerable about the ways in which I have messed up and I'm still a consent educator and I'm still writing workbooks and I'm constantly learning. You know, I think it'd be really nice if we respected people more for acknowledging that their work's in progress. I think in the age of Instagram influencers and stuff, there is this sense of like needing to have the right answer and not just like a right answer, but you are the right answer so that people come to you and not to other people. And it just really ruins critical thinking skills as far as I'm concerned. I really want mm. people to decide what's right for them, not what I think is right for them. I don't know them. It's true yeah. that we have often come to the conclusion if we were a little more decisive and punchy, we'd probably have many more Instagram likes ourselves. But could we live with yep. ourselves? <laughs> That's the question. Yeah. Is it yeah. ethical? <laughs> Right. Yeah, exactly. it would be more successful, but is it ethical? And that, that's, yeah. yeah, I have that conversation with myself all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, briefly, before we dive into our listener questions today, tell us about the new workbook. Yeah, so I wrote a workbook called Ask Yourself the Consent Culture Workbook, and it's 28 prompts. So the idea being you could do it in a month. It would be a really intense month <laughs> if you did that. <laughs> Uh, it was an intense month for me writing it. But the idea is to look at what have you learned about consent? What stories were you brought up with? What was your family like, your environment like? What's your culture like around consent? What were some positive things that you learned from that? What were some maybe negative things that you've learned or had to unlearn? What did that look like? So really starting that consent conversation in the first week with internalized navel gazing. <laughs> and then we go from there to you and your close relationships, which can mean your lovers, but can also mean your family, can mean your kids, can mean your best friend, like people who you are in contact with on a more intimate basis, emotionally, directly. That's the second week. The third week expands out a little bit more into the community and consent interactions within activism or tabletop RPGs or, you know, various institutions. And then I bring it all back to internal navel gazing again of like, OK, let's look back at what you thought when you started this workbook. Has anything sh shaken loose for you? How are you feeling about this? Like, what are some things you might try differently? I interviewed a bunch of different people. So it has anecdotes that kind of illustrate the questions that I'm posing. That was really important to me because as with the first book, I wanted to make sure that my voice, that of a white cis woman, was not the voice of consent. I wanted to say, look, there are people in here who their anecdotes are things I agree with, but it's important for you to see how different people interact with these things and interface with them so that you can better make your own decisions. Awesome. That's great. Now it's time to dive into some conversation about common consent concerns and questions that listeners brought to us specifically for this episode. But before we do that, we want to take a quick break to talk about how you can support this show and keep this content coming to everyone out there for free every week. And that is to just take a moment, check out our sponsors. If any seem interesting to you, go visit them, use our promo codes. It does directly help support our show. And if you're able, you can support us at multiamory.com slash join. Let's get to some listener questions now, shall we? Let's do it. All right. So quick disclaimer here. The four of us on this show have spent a lot of time studying healthy relationship, communication, and consent in the case of Kitty, but we are not perfect, we're not experts, and we're also not mind readers. So our advice and comments here is based solely on the limited information that we have about these situations, so take it with a grain of salt, of course. Every situation out there, whether it's these ones that we're going to be talking about today or your own unique situation, it's your own. You know, we encourage you to use your own judgment and seek professional help if needed. Ultimately, you're the only true expert in your own life and feelings and your decisions are your own. So we got 
a lot of really great questions. So sorry that we can't get to everybody's questions. A lot of these questions have been edited for clarity, but we do have access to the full questions in case we need any context. And last time we did a Q&A episode, we did say that if you had a clever sign-off name, we would bump you up in the queue. And there were a lot of people who got the assignment and made a clever (laughs) sign-off. I've tried to prioritize your questions as much as I can. Some of your questions, even though the sign-off was great, were not necessarily a great fit for this episode. So my apologies, but please, we love the sign-offs. Please keep them coming. I'm going to dive in with question number one. And question number one is actually about 20 different questions lumped <laughs> That's into usually the one. case, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, because we got a lot of repeat questions. I'm calling the ca- this category like consent dilemma questions or tricky consent situations. So there were a couple of recurring themes. I, I identified two recurring themes in a lot of these questions. One recurring theme was someone having a retroactive realization after the fact that an interaction was non-consensual. You know, so a lot of people asked about these situations where someone has realized after an encounter, maybe days later, sometimes a year later, sometimes years later, that their consent had been violated by someone else. And, you know, maybe it was they realized that they were in a state of freeze During the interaction, they couldn't say no, or, you know, maybe it was tricky because the other person hadn't used any physical force or violence or maybe overt manipulation in that way. So that was one recurring theme. And then the other recurring theme in these questions was both parties being absolutely mortified once this came to light. So I I don't mean just the person whose consent was violated wakes up one day and realizes that happened and, and they're mortified by it, but like, Also, this happening on the quote unquote perpetrator side, someone realizing years later, oh, my God, I think I did something non-consensual. Like, I think I crossed a line here and like I'm horrified. And it seems like no one knows how to resolve or rectify these situations. You know, is it okay? automatically have to go no contact and expel this person from my life or from my community? The person who realizes that their consent was violated after the fact Is it good? Is it appropriate? Is it healing to reach out to the other person? And what about the reverse? If you realized, oh, my God, I think I maybe did something non-consensual. Should I reach out to them? Should I apologize? Should I let it go? I don't know. So this is what I mean by it's 20 different questions on top of 20 different questions. But anywhere in that spaghetti you want to jump in, (laughs) I think it's a good place to jump in. I think... This is one of those areas that is really hard. Again, we live in a culture where we violate our own consent all the time. That was one of the things that I really cared about bringing up in the workbook was that we aren't really encouraged to think about what we want. (laughs) We are encouraged to think about how we can please others and or how we can win in a situation. There's this sort of competition that sort of taints interactions. So I think that that, I think this happens a lot. I mean, you know, I've thought about situations in my life. I was like, yeah, I don't know that my consent was 100 percent there. But then also there have been situations like that where I didn't feel violated afterwards. Like I was I could recognize like, yeah, my consent was questionable or that was that was murky. But I feel fine. There are situations where I 100% know that my consent was not present, but I also don't feel traumatized by it. You know, I, so I think that that, do you have trauma around it? And maybe first work on that before you start thinking about like your responsibility or to the community or to another person in talking to them about it, that number one, figure out what you need to help yourself feel safe right now. And that's also true if you think that you may have done perpetration of some kind to somebody else. I think focus on like, okay, let me sit with this. Let me have the feelings that I'm going to have about it. Because the last thing that like, if you are correct and you've crossed somebody's consent, the last thing they need is to make you feel better about it. (laughs) So like Mm. sort that out first and then you could go to that person and talk to them about it. But like, have that be something that you bring up in therapy. Maybe talk to other people about, I feel bad about this. And I would like to figure out not how to feel better, but how to be a better person, like how to take this and learn from it. 
I think from the perspective of someone whose consent has been violated, I think sitting with, wow, like, okay, I froze. Like I had a really hard time saying no in that moment. Why is that? How can I use this information to learn some better tools to communicate with partners in the future so that I know that if a violation happens, it is in bad faith. <laughs> I feel like that's a really difficult part of this is I think so many situations I hear about violations happen, but everybody is acting in good faith and doing the best they can. And sometimes people get hurt. Sometimes you step on somebody's foot, even when you didn't mean to. That is a very different situation than somebody stamped on my foot repeatedly while I told them not to, or somebody stamped on my foot it was clear they wanted to cause harm, even if I didn't pull away. Like, I think that th those feel very different. So mm -hmm. sitting and, and being in your body and seeing like, how do my guts feel? How does my skin feel when I think about this? Does this make me afraid? Do I get feel anxious? Learning how to sit in that, I think, and tell yourself that, yes, that happened and that sucks and you are out of that right now, and here are some ways that you can take care of yourself. I think that has to be the first step. I wanted to bring up the kind of patterns that you spoke about before, that if there is a pattern of the violation of consent, and you found like going back in your mind and realizing, okay, that thing that happened to me was part of a pattern, I feel like sometimes that can lead to more, okay, perhaps I need to talk about this in therapy, or perhaps I need to even go so far as to cut that person out of my life to a degree. I'm thinking about, I was in a situation with, with my half-brother, who's much older than I am. There was a pattern of kind of strangeness that ended in basically him touching me in a really, really inappropriate way when he was very drunk. And I don't yeah. really speak to him much anymore and haven't in years. And I feel like that was the right decision for me, even though it was really challenging. But again, it was because I had realized there was a pattern of those things happening. And even if I did speak to him about it specifically and say, this is not OK, I didn't know that that would necessarily change. So I think questioning instances like this in terms of how you're going to continue to interact with this person or not i think those things have to be looked at like is it worth it to yeah. me to even go there and try to discuss with them hey you did this thing to me in the past i'm now realizing it was really challenging for me and maybe you know i want to fix that or i want us to come to some understanding for future interactions, maybe that's not even going to be a thing or a place you want to go to. And I think that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. I think call-outs are an area, call-outs and call-ins, I think, are very similar to me um, in my understanding because they involve being invested in the other person's growth. And there are people that you don't feel invested in, and that's fine. Yeah. You know, like, you can't be that for everybody. And if someone has shown that they aren't interested in growing or they're not invested in growing with you, yeah, then don't bother, you know? I think that something that I've learned for myself is that sometimes, especially when I've gone through a breakup, my friends are very quick to see patterns where patterns may or may not actually be. Hmm. And that is another thing to be wary of sure. without actually invalidating your experiences and i think that can be very very complicated like i had a, i had a bad breakup i had an ex-boyfriend who uh told me i was murdering my cat because i put my cat to sleep when he was very very sick and i broke up with him for this um no regrets <laughs> and you know i was talking to me i was processing like our breakup texts and stuff with my friends and my friends were like oh well, he's clearly a narcissist because they saw behaviors mm. that to them said narcissism. And I was like, well, I mean, as somebody who focuses a lot on mental health stigma and 
especially personality disorders and how often they're misprescribed to people that when you're not a professional, like I'm very hesitant to say that. I don't think that's true. I don't even identify his behavior as abusive. It may have been abusive to someone else. For me, I didn't see it as abusive. I saw it as him attempting to control me and failing. I didn't feel, maybe because I didn't feel broken up about it, I didn't feel abused by it. But I could see how my friends and their experiences, they saw patterns that for me weren't patterns. Or I identified very different patterns. I saw a pattern where this was a person who really struggled with death, whose mother had died when he was very young and he didn't respond well when friends of mine had died, when my grandmother died. So my cat dying was kind of a last straw. And mm. like, I can understand that without forgiving him. I don't need to forgive him. I'm not invested in him anymore. I'm not invested in his growth or his evolution. That said, all that said, I was approached a week ago, I think, by a bunch of his exes who were like, we need your help to understand some of the patterns of behavior that we're experiencing. And I was like, here's a breakup journal that I wrote when I was going through it <laughs> like four years ago. Here, read that and see what you like. You might see things that you recognize in there understand that not all of the baggage there is yours to take on. Maybe you're invested in, in helping him understand how these things hurt other people, and maybe you're not, and either way is fine. Yeah, it was a really interesting turning point for me to be like, I don't need him to be a monster. I am just not invested in him as long as he is not invested in learning these things. If he's not interested in being accountable, I'm not gonna waste my time trying to hold him accountable. So it's it's complicated, I, though, right? <laughs> it is complicated, but I'm really glad that we ended up at this place because I think that that actually really connects to a piece of this spaghetti pile of many different questions, which it brings up that question of, do I need to make someone a monster in order for myself to feel healed? Do I need to find some reasoning by, or like find a label, right? Do I need to make him a narcissist in order for me to feel like my hurt feelings are justified and therefore I can heal? Or do I need to get super invested in this person's growth and like mm -hmm. their growing is directly attached to me healing? Like I can't heal unless I see them growing and changing. And, and I think that is tied to some of the questions that people asked about, oh my goodness, like if I realize someone crossed a line, like do I need to reach out to them? Like, is that the only way that I can heal? Or like we brought up with the, if you're on the other side of it, like is the only way I can heal this is if I try to make it right and try to get this other person to make me feel better, that I think it does obscure the fact that so much of our healing, fortunately or unfortunately, there's so much of our healing that needs to happen on our own. You know, like yeah. there is some healing that can happen in community. There is some healing that can happen relationally between us and the other person. But like largely so much of our healing is our own. And we can mistake making the other person a monster or getting super invested in how they change or whether or not they're going to do better of confusing that with like, oh, that's what's going to be healing for me. You know, I mean, and th this is... This is not yeah. news. This is, this is you know, foundational to a lot of transformative justice theory of realizing that punitive action does not equal healing and restitution. But, but yeah, I think it's interesting because I do think there's an undercurrent of that here. Yeah. Well, you know, it, as you were saying that, it made me think a lot. I, I don't get along well with 12-step. I'm in recovery, but I don't get along well with 12-step in a lot of ways. But I do think there's an interesting lesson in 12-step where that kind of making your apologies is the eighth step. Like you're almost towards, you're getting towards the end of your steps. You've done a lot of work before you do that. And I think that there is something really important about that. Now, I, I do have issues with the way that 12 step, like kind of encourages you to feel a lot of shame. I don't think that's healthy, but whatever. Like there's other, there's other sobriety things out there. But I do think it's really important to recognize like, yes, you can do that work even when you've harmed other people, you will be in a better place to apologize when you can say, I know what I did wrong. Here is what I should have done instead. And here's what I'm doing for the future. And honestly, the other person, whether they respond to your apology or not, they will have a little bit more of a sense of your investment when A, 
you don't demand a response from them when it's not about that. And B, when you can show that you are showing a pattern of fixing these behaviors. Like for myself, I was like, I don't want to be doing hallucinogens with a sexual partner. I don't think that's a good idea for me. Like, I think I need to be with somebody who is like on the same vibe as me, who is my compatriot slash handler. <laughs> and like, we're doing that for each other. I think that is a better idea for me than a situation that creates a weird sexual dynamic that could get messy really fast. I mean, also, I was on a substance, and if he had taken it in a direction I didn't want, that would have been even more complicated. <laughs> yeah, I think that these things are really hard. And I think that you might try a type of restitution or, uh, you know, you might try something and it doesn't work. Someone might not forgive you. Someone might not care that they hurt you. The only person you can control is yourself. That is that is like maybe the thing I tell myself in my <laughs> sobriety slash recovery for being an activist all the time. The only person I have control over is myself. And so to really sit with that means I have to let go of expectations for other people's behavior. I can decide if I want to engage with them and the behaviors that they do, but I can't make them do anything. And that is aggravating and also so freeing. Oh my God, I sleep mm -hmm. so much better now. <laughs> Yeah, the, I just want to come back a little bit to the conversation about what you can learn from these kinds of realizations and just to also rope in a little bit of my personal story with this, that I had an experience back in 2018 or something like that of having my consent violated and, and being very upset about it, but in this very like I froze kind of way. Like even a fawning kind of way, right? Of like looking back, I'm like, fuck, I'm like smiling a lot during this, even though I was like deeply uncomfortable and, and upset by this. And that two things. One, I wasn't very good at proactively dealing with the like emotional traumatic part of all mm -hmm. of that. And that also the few times that I did try to reach out to professionals about it, I found that they were not very helpful. And I think there's a whole other maybe field of some complication yeah. here when it comes to gender and stuff like yep. that, um, that, that complicated things further. But in, in thinking about what you're talking about, these different things, I feel like I've gone through all of these phases. It was like the first is I want this person to be punished, right? Mm -hmm. I, I want this person to be kicked off of couch surfing. That's, that's how this came to be, mm. right? Like I want them to be punished by them and they were completely non-responsive and did nothing about it. And so I'm really mad about it and I'm upset about it. But then also it led to, again, thinking about my behavior and how, you know, his, his reaction was to be mad at me for accusing him of this and that I'm the bad guy. And then thinking about it through and seeing like as much as I hate it, being like, yeah, I can also see this from his point of view and that that clicked into focus. Oh, my God. What about all of these times where I've probably been the him? in this situation to varying degrees, right? Of that just kind of like pressuring rather than any kind of like physical or, or threat or like direct, like you said no and I'm saying yes kind of thing. But it's all mm -hmm. that subtle other stuff that the you've been talking about. Yeah, yeah, all of that or the, the people pleasing, <laughs> yep. right? Or the power yep. dynamic that you're not aware of or like all those things. And it, it led to, I would say several years of, of having a very hard time coming to terms with all of that of the, the baggage around consent from myself, like realizing, oh God, like this, this is so much more pervasive than I thought it was. Like these sort of invisible power dynamics that we're not aware of. Yep. Also at the same time, weirdly having more sympathy for him and, mm -hmm. and, and situations and like, but then also being mad about it and upset about it yep. and upset <laughs> that I was hurt and that no one took me seriously and no one cared about how I felt. And everyone instead was focused on these other things. And it was just, Boy, like even thinking about it now, I'm still emotional about this roller coaster that I was on for several years after that. And just it's very validating to hear you talk about all of this. And I'm realizing now I should have gone to you and paid you for coaching or something because that would have been really <laughs> Hey, helpful. you still can. <laughs> there you go. Maybe well, I still will. I mean, I mean, I think 
I've I've been sort of a counsel counselor isn't really the right word. Like I I hate the idea that like I'm a life coach because I really ugh. I feel you. I feel um, you. It's a dirty you term. Know, <laughs> a really it's dirty just, term. There's so many of them that are so predatory, and that's uh, like yeah. not my jam at all. But I've I've been that person for a lot of a lot of guys in particular who are just like I thought I knew about all of this. And I didn't know. And there's so many, like, triggers and, like, just trip wires everywhere that I'm just trying to navigate. Like, I've heard a guy be like, you know, like, well, what am I supposed to do? I was, I have to admit, I've been asexual now for, like, four years. Doing consent culture broke me. It is Mm. hard work. And it is deeply difficult work. I feel like I'm better able to do it because I've abstained from relationships for a while in order to better hone my instincts and my understanding and being able to see red flags. That's not practical for a lot of people. And like, I can't honestly say if I'm asexual now because of the trauma or because I always was and I got traumatized because I was pushing myself through it anyway. I don't know. My therapist says it doesn't matter, which <laughs> fine. I guess that's fine. Um, but I mean, I I do think that there's also this sense that we have to be always healing. Like this is something that you have to get better from. And like sometimes you're just going to be wounded and like that's just going to be there until it doesn't need to be anymore. I, I don't think you can force that kind of stuff either. You know, you can give it the best space to grow. But you also kind of have to let it have that space to either it's going to going to blossom or it's not. And I I mean, but I think that that is really interesting because that speaks a lot, for example, to the whole walk it off kind of attitude that we have when you get injured or like, oh, you feel sick. Well, go into work anyway. Push through it, you know, Mm -hmm. and like I think we are like that with our emotions just as much as we're like that about physical stuff like, oh, you feel tired. Don't go to sleep. Take lots of caffeine, you know, (laughs) like we're constantly pushing through our discomfort. And this is the kind of thing that I want to talk about when it comes to violating our own consent, where we I mean, a lot of the reason why I drank was because I felt uncomfortable and it never occurred to me I could just leave. If I don't want to be at this party, I could just leave. And now that I do that, I don't need the alcohol, you know, like that was that was it was that simple for me. And it's not to say that it's that simple for everybody. I think that, you know, I am in a very luxurious position of being raised as a queer person by extremely accepting parents who were like second wave feminists who then became third wave feminists through raising me, who took me to march outside of abortion clinics when I was five, you know, like I had the best possible container to think about this stuff in a lot of different ways. So like, I also want to acknowledge that because I have had all of that, I don't expect everybody to have all of that. And I have a lot of sympathy for people who find it really difficult because it's difficult for me even with this ideal container. This has been fantastic so far, and we can't wait to continue this conversation with you next week, Kitty, to get to more of these questions from our listeners, because I think this is a topic that people just really crave these answers, because it's something we're taught is so important, and yet we're not taught a lot of good tools for how to actually apply this in a healthy way in our lives, right? It's like we talked about at the top. It's people are all looking for these black and white rules or how to decide if someone's a good or bad person. And clearly we've seen already just with one question out of the several that we got, I guess that was several questions combined into one, but there's so much here. And I'm really excited for us to continue that. Kitty, before we wrap up for today, could you tell us where can listeners find your book, Uh, all of the content that you make, as well as your new workbooks, all of that. Yeah, so I'm pretty easy to find. I'm Kitty Stryker on most social media. Instagram, I think I'm Kitty underscore Stryker because Instagram kicked me off for showing my nipples years back. And I am no longer on Twitter. Twitter banned me for impersonating libs of TikTok. Totally worth it. (laughs) (laughs) 
Amazing. But I'm on I'm on Blue Sky, I'm on Post, I'm on Medium, I'm on Facebook. There's an officially Kitty Striker Facebook page to follow like the various podcasts I'm on and books that I've written. I also have a website, kittystriker.com, that desperately needs to be updated, <laughs> but I'll get to it one day. And you could find a lot of my projects and stuff there. Yeah, so uh, then if you're looking for my books, they are by Thorn Apple Press. And you can find them on Amazon. Uh, you can find them on Thrift Books. I don't mind. They're also available at Firestorm Cooperative, which is a bookstore that I'm going to be doing a sort of book club slash community workshop thing. We're basically going to go over one question per week from Ask Yourself the Consent Culture Workbook and do it as a group. So that should be really exciting. I don't know wow. how that's going to work, but you can come find out with me. It'll be Sundays from September 10th, I think, until October 1st. And I want to say that's at 11 a.m. Pacific. And it's free. So, you know, you can find out more information about that on Facebook. You can also find it on Firestorm's website. And I have a new workbook that should be coming out in April that's going to be called Say More Consent Conversations for Teens. It was originally going to just be a really quick little reworking of Ask Yourself, but with more teenage focused scenarios. But I realized I had to like rip the whole book apart and start fresh because the way that I talk about this stuff with teens is a little bit different from the way that I talk about it with adults. Also, it's very similar in some ways. And I formatted that one where teens actually propose the questions. Oh, nice. So wow. I answer questions that teens gave and then I give some questions back to them. But I, I talk about complicated stuff like, is it non-consensual if they said yes, but they didn't mean it? You know, simple, easy questions like that. <laughs> so um, while it is focused towards teens, I think it'll probably be very applicable to adults as well. And it has all different resources specifically for teens in there. And yeah, it should be coming out in April. I just finished the first draft, so... Awesome. Exciting. Wow. Amazing. Wonderful. Congratulations. Wonderful. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank and thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. It's been fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, listeners, our question this week that's going to be on our Instagram stories is Have you made any consent mistakes? And just in case anybody's worried, answering a question on our stories is anonymous. We're not going to out you, but we want to hear from you. Have you made any consent mistakes? Maybe you can share what you've learned from making some mistakes in the past. The best place to share your thoughts about this episode with other listeners is in the episode discussion channel in our Discord server, or you can post about it in our private Facebook group. You can get access to these groups and you can join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok. Multiamory is created and produced by Jace Lindgren, Emily Matlack, and me, Dedeker Winston. Our production assistants are Rachel Shenowork and Carson Collins. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. 